And joining us now is Don McCullen, photojournalist and the first photographer to be elected commander in the Order of the British Empire. He's also the subject of the documentary McCullen, which premiered in April at the Canadian International Documentary Film Festival, Hot Dogs. Hello. Uh, good morning. I read somewhere that you have traveled to some 120 countries, but one of them that you haven't been to is Canada. This is your first time here, so welcome to Canada. Uh, isn't that extraordinary? I, I've I've come to Canada, but I've, I'm trapped in this city of Toronto, so it's hardly <laughs> Canada. Well, I, you know, when I, when I read that, I was thinking, why hasn't he been to Canada? To, but since you cover conflict and go to wars, I suppose it's a, it's a compliment to us that you haven't been here in some ways. Exactly, yes. <laughs> I want to start really at the beginning and um, with your early childhood. You were born in 1935 in London, which means you were a young boy uh, during uh, the World War II. What do you recall of that time? Well, first of all, when the war came, uh, my mother sent my sister and I away to the countryside, actually to a place where I live today because it's so beautiful. Um, when the war finished, I came back to London and my mother gave my sister away to the people who, because we came from such a poor family that my mo mother felt that my sister would have a, a better opportunity in life by being allowed to stay with this slightly well-to-do family who sent her to boarding schools and educated her. and. Uh, and I got the short end of the stick. I went back to London and, and lived in the tenement slum where I grew up, and uh, which in a way... Finsbury Park, right? Finsbury it's Park is north London. What's it like? You wouldn't want to, to live there or go there. There's nothing very, very attractive about it. But I think it served me well because it was, it was harsh. Um, it was a, a mean place. Mm. Mean-spirited people lived there because they felt that they were, you know, put upon by the layers of society that, that England used to be structured by. When you say it served you well, what do you mean by that in terms of how it shaped your photography? Well, I grew up with um, you know, people who didn't go to school. Uh, my mother was never in the house. My father died very early on in my life. And uh, the boys I grew up with expected you to become, you know, uh, to fight, to steal. To you know, desecrate the kind of what poverty we even lived in, uh, around the atmosphere, like shop shop windows and stealing in Wallace the stores, and mm -hmm. basically we just had a grudge against society. How do you break? How did you break away from that and become a photographer? Tell me about your early experiences. Well, I eventually, when I was 18 years of age, by then of course I had no father, and I was pretty disenchanted about life, and I went into the air force to do my two years military service. And I was sent to a photographic unit. Uh, I went to Egypt, and I went to Cyprus, I went to uh, the Middle East, I went to Africa. And by doing so, I started seeing other people's lives. They weren't always much better than the life that I grew up in, but nevertheless, you know, other cultures. And when I uh, left the Air Force, I failed to become a photographer because I basically couldn't read the theory paper mm. And so I didn't get my official RAF blessing as a photographer, so I left. But I did take a, a camera back to, to, to where I live. But of course, when I got home, I pawned it. There was a particular photo that you took, though, that got you into the business, if you will. Tell me about that. Well, um, before I pawned the camera, I was all of these gangs of boys I went to school with. and. Uh, you know, they were pretty rebellious. And uh, one day they said, why don't you go and get that camera? and take some pictures of us, you know, you never do. And I said, okay. So I, I was at the bottom of the street where I lived in this derelict building. So I ran up to my house and got the camera and came down. And I said to the boys, jump up in that, that building. It was totally derelict. And uh, I wasn't to know this, but some, a few months later on, the boys were involved in a gang clash with another gang. Because in those days in England, it was the late 50s, it was very tribal where I lived. Mm. You know, you didn't go to other, other people's kind of areas because you'd be attacked and vice versa. And one night, a gang came from another area and there was a fight at the bottom of the street where I took this very photograph. And a policeman tried to intervene and somebody stabbed him in the back and he died there and then. And, you know, to kill a policeman in those days was a capital offence. You were hung for it. And subsequently, the man who did it was a 25-year-old uh, laborer. He, he was hung for this offense. And the Observer newspaper published my photographs because I was encouraged to take my pictures to the newspaper. And overnight, after the publication, I was offered every job in England. 
So you saw war firsthand as a soldier, and then you came back home, you took a photograph that the Observer publishes. How do you then transition from being a regular photographer, if I can put it that way, into being a war photographer that has seen just about every conflict in this world in your lifetime? Well, I was, I was totally deficient of knowledge of photography, photojournalism, it was called, or photo reportage. I had no knowledge, and I had to quickly um, acquire this knowledge and I bought magazines and I met other young photographers and it, it took a bit of time, it took two or three years for me to to understand it all and mm. I, I, I somehow fell into it naturally and then one day I went into the Observer newspaper's office. By then I must say that I went to Berlin. I, I saw some photographs of uh, East German soldier jumping over a wire into West Berlin with his Kalashnikov and his full military uh, uh, uniform. Mm. And I said to my wife, you know, would you mind if I went there? So I went to Berlin with, with no money. I bought a ticket and I was almost penniless when I arrived. But they were constructing the wall. There was the Americans facing the Russians. Some voice in me said, you must go to Berlin. And um, you've got to bear in mind, I wasn't the most sophisticated or intelligent young man at the time. I was just over 20 years of age and you know I'd been very much uh, sheltered by the environment I grew up in despite going on these other trips in the military. The military look after you, you see. Mm. So this is the first time I traveled independently with my own uh, mind guiding me the best it could. Your first official assignment was in Cyprus in 1964. That's right. And that's when you won the, the World Press Photo Award. Yes. Um, there's a particular photo there in Cyprus that I want to talk about in a minute, but tell me what your reaction was. I mean, you were a, a, a young man. You'd heard gunshots, obviously, during the war as a soldier, but as a photographer, tell me what it was like, to your reaction when you heard those first shots fired. Well, I drove into a, a little town that's the second largest town in Cyprus. It was called Limassol. Um, and I, as I was in the middle of driving in a hired car in the middle of town, I heard this barking noise and I thought, oh my goodness, the exhaust has fallen off of the car. So I foolishly got out of the car, went round the back, lie down in the road. The exhaust pipe was perfectly happy sitting there, but it was a Bren gun firing over the top another Bren gun. They were, I was in the middle alone in no man's land on, in crossfire. So I got in the car and drove like crazy and zigzagged all over the place and finally got into a side street and abandoned the car. And I, I, I was being shouted at by some Turkish um, irregulars. And they would say, come here, come here. And I went and they said, you know, there's a war on, you know. Mm. And um, so they, they, I realized that I was the only one there. The rest of the world's press were on the other side of the island. I want to show this picture, if we can just bring it up here. Can you tell me, tell, narrate this for me? What's going on in this photo here? Well, I'd been on the island a few days after I managed to get out of this big battle in Limassol, and then that was my baptism of fire. And so I was building confidence. And then I went to another village because the, there were gun battles breaking out all over these Turkish villages you know, perpetrated mm. by the Greeks. And I went to the village and, and the British army at that stage were playing a NATO role. They were wearing blue berets. So uh, I went to this village. I saw this British soldier. It's quite comforting to speak the same languages. And I said, what's going on here? And he said, oh, there's a dead body over there. There's plenty of more in that house up there. And I saw this dead body. And to be truthful, like the only dead body I'd ever seen in my life was my own father when they brought mm. him to the house. So this was my first dead uh, body outside of my own family life. So, and this soldier said, oh, by the way, he's been shot in the face with a shotgun. So, and I thought, well, look at his feet first. And I, I looked at his feet and, and my eyes traversed to the top and saw this ghastly face. And I thought, God, I can't do this. So I, I went to the house and I knocked on the door. Had, I, I didn't get any answer. So I turned the little doorknob and let myself in. And the floor was covered in blood with two bodies. And, and I can still today smell the heat of that blood as it greeted me when I went in. I said, hello, hello. There was nobody there. So I closed the door. I stepped over the blood, got into the corner and started taking pictures. And to my horror, the door opened and a woman burst in. And I thought, my goodness, you know, they're going to be so angry. They're going to attack me. But they didn't. 
and the woman had a towel and she was very distressed and the man who was in front of me, the immediate corpse in front of me, was her new husband. And in the back of the, the room to my left was their wedding present. They were married a week before and the wedding presents were very, you know, cheap and simple mm. kind of cups and saucers. And they'd been smashed by the people who murdered the, the two brothers. Their father was in the back room also murdered. And I started taking pictures very slowly, very gently, because I was seeking their approval, which they seemed to have given me by not attacking me. You tell this story like it happened yesterday. Well, that's quite true because, you know, everything I did in my life was yesterday, but can be today quite easily. I can dredge these stories up and they're not welcome, really. Welcome to you. Well, I, they're not welcome by me. I, I, you know, I, I have another life outside of the history of, of my photographic life. I'm another person, really. I think I am, but maybe I'm not. I want to ask you about your job as a photojournalist. Um, we really don't need any reminders, though we get them all the time, of how dangerous your line of work is. Uh, Marie Colvin, the British journalist, and Remy Ochlik, the photojournalist who just mm -hmm. recently died in Syria, the recent examples. There's a saying in our business, I'm sure you've heard it, especially for your line of work, which is there's a fine line between be being brave and stupid. Yeah. How did you walk the line so well all these years? Well, I, I think I, 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 I used to take the probably stupid route thinking that our good Lord up there, if he ever was there, because I've always thought I was an atheist. When my father died, I thought, I'm going to turn against the church. I, but the irony is that when, when I was in terrible trouble in gun battles or I was being shelled, what did I do? I used to look at the sky and say, please God, don't let me die today. I'll do anything. I'll be, be really good. I'll come back to you. You know, it was amazing. You know, I became the ultimate Judas. But um, I used to have this belief that if I could run fast enough, which is really silly, mm. that I'd make it, you know. Uh, and I sometimes did run incredibly fast when I was young, and I did make it. And, and eventually, of course, you will get caught. You did get caught in Cambodia, and yeah. I want to bring up another photo, one that you took. If we can bring that up. Uh, explain to me what's happening in this photo and, and what you were doing during this time. Well, I got, you know, I was a bit cocky when I was young. I thought, you know, I've got to get to the front. I've got, I've got to be there. I must be there. And um, I got, um, it was a friend of mine came to the hotel and said, oh, by the way, if you want some action, I think there, there's a, uh, some Khmer's have been filled at the edge of Phnom Penh. But by then it was getting towards the evening, and um, in those days, because we, you know, we didn't have digital cameras, there was a cut-off point where your film simply wasn't possible to use. It was getting dark and dusk, you know, the dusk right. was coming. So I went to this meeting point. My friend dropped me off and cleared off. And uh, these Cambodians, you know, were getting out of this truck, and then they got their act together. It wasn't convincing, but they walked towards this bridge, and there was an almighty. Um, you know, incoming attack on us. I fled down the side of the bank because the you know the bullets were whipping that road, and it was uh, it was too dangerous. And I, I th and then I lie down in this gully with all the rest of these soldiers. People were treading on each other, and there was some screams and shouts. People had been hit with bullets, and I thought, you know, come on, Don, don't be a coward. So they counterattacked, and they cl climbed up the the side of the the road, which. Um, I got behind a jeep and there was an almighty explosion. And all I could feel was a kind of searing burning pain in my legs and the lower part of You'd my been body. Wounded. So it seems I seemed to be suddenly bleeding and I was in great pain. And I thought, do not be captured by the Khmer Rouge who were trying to surround us. And, and you know, basically that's what ambushes are about, mm. is to encircle you. And the Khmer Rouge have a, a very bad record for killing journalists. Fifteen had been killed at that point within the first couple of weeks of, of me arriving there. Journalist. What I find remarkable is that here you are, an injured man, and yet you have the wherewithal to keep doing your job. And that's that photo of the man in the truck. You, while injured laying there, you took a photo of him. Well, I crawled away from once I, I, I thought, don't be captured. I'd even, there was a river, the Great River was on the side of it, uh, and I thought, you know, rather than be captured, I could dump my cameras and go into the river and swim because I was a really good swimmer. I did not want to be captured by these people. I knew they would murder you. So um, I crawled away for a couple hundred yards. Someone came and stabbed me with a morphine. 
Then they threw me on the truck, took me back to the point of the explosion, and then started bringing the other wounded on. And the man in question uh, died on the way back to the hospital. By then it was evening, and we were going to the, into the suburbs of Phnom Penh, and people were standing on their verandas looking down, and they suddenly saw this military truck go by full of blood and gore. And the, I knew this man was dead after I'd made this photograph because he, when they lay him down, his feet were by my face and they were wobbling with the truck movement. It was very bizarre. And I, I thought by taking the photographs, it would take my mind off of my own situation. You have talked um, about how your shift in motivation for going to war through your career. Why, when and why does that shift happen to you? Because um, I'd been going down the wrong road. I'd been basically following the Hollywood image of war, which uh, is, is absurd. Even to this day, it's absurd. And um, I, I didn't take into account seriously, because I was a young man, remember, so I was obviously looking to test myself and to show off a bit, which was certainly wrong now I look back. So I wanted to see if I could hack it, you know. Mm. But, and then I started going to wars where I could see, well, particularly in Phnom Penh in Cambodia, the civilians but picking up the bill for the, for the war, you know, you saw people who've been hit with rockets in their homes while they're having their dinner at night and ghastly scenes of, you know, children with limbs hanging off and, you know, I, they're almost too awful to describe. Mm. And then I started saying to myself, hang on, you, you, you know, you've been getting this all wrong. This is the price of war. After all, soldiers are trained to kill other soldiers and they're expected occasionally to get killed and be wounded but not the civilians. So I, um, I started then going to wars where I totally focused on civilian uh, suffering. I want to talk about those kinds of pictures. Um, Biafra in, in Africa is probably where some of your most notorious photos come from. Um, the one of the starving Biafra and albino b boy. How did your experience in Nigeria change you? I mean, looking at this photo, I think, changes everyone, at least in a small way, just looking at it. But how did that experience change you? Because this photograph is possibly one of the most obscene photographs I've ever taken. And I've taken quite a few, uh, you know, unpleasant images. But, you know, it is my job to do that. You know, the truth is, if you're going to come back with an image like that, you've got to make sure that someone's going to publish it. It did get published, because I worked for the Sunday Times in those days, and they weren't afraid to, you know, to stick their necks out and be, you know, and, and uh, but I, I used to stick my neck out and risk my life, so it wasn't much to ask of them to publish my photos. And after all, this is, that was the kind of photograph that needed publishing to say it's totally unacceptable. So I went into this camp with all these hundreds of dying children, uh, black children, of course. But this boy, because he was an albino, totally stood out. And the moment I walked in there, he focused on me. I mean, the, the, the only way I can describe this boy, uh, because of his pathetic condition of, of starvation, he looked like a, a living skeleton. And he focused on me, and I thought, I can't, I can't look at this boy, I can't take it, you know. As tough as I thought I was, you know, thank God I had some decency in my makeup to be able to feel this, this crime. So I thought, I'll go away and I'll busy myself in another direction. There was plenty to do there. Children were dropping down and dying. Two or three years, so, you know, children of two and three years of age dying. And um, so I spoke to a French doctor and whilst I was talking to him, I suddenly felt somebody touch my hand. I looked down and there was this boy trying to hold my hand. Wow. And I thought, my God, I wish you'd not choose me, you know. Leave me alone, I can't, I can't look at you. And it was really, you know, it was too much. And, so I gave him a sweet from my pocket, and he went away. And the moment he got that sweet, the other children wanted to take that sweet from him. If your photos can convey, I mean, they're so intimate in looking at them, they're so intimate mm -hmm. to you as well. If they can convey what you felt in those moments, I mean, is that your purpose? Is that why you went to war? Well, there would be no other reason to go, surely. Uh, only, only other to be, uh, become a voyeur or to indulge myself in, 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 the, in a pastime of thinking about my own life. My own life is unimportant, really. My duty 
you know, there would be, you know, nothing um, other than to, you know, find and seek out these atrocities and this kind of awfulness and, you know, uh, war in, you know, whilst Hollywood, you know, was always trying to glamorize war and it even does today, which is totally wrong. I went there to show you how, how obscene and, 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 you know, obnoxious the whole situation is and, um, you know, we still seem to tolerate it. A number of years ago you wrote a book called Sleeping with Ghosts. Yes. And I'm curious, are you still sleeping with ghosts? Yes, I am in a way, because the house I live in in Somerset, which is the most glorious place on earth, so beautiful where I live, um, even if it rains or it snows, it's still amazing. I wake up in the morning and see this valley which sweeps up to the site of a Roman hill temple. Um, yet in that house there are 60,000 negatives, 5,000 um, 5, prints which I've made personally. Um, so um, I think to myself when I'm in that house, I spent many years living alone in that house, I, I don't know, but I think I used to think of myself at night when I close the lights, close the, the house down into night, that, that that house had a spiritual haunted side to it because of all those images in those filing cabinets. Mm. Uh, that's why I called the book I did Sleeping with a Ghost. You still travel a lot. You see, probably, I'm imagining out there a lot of guys, women, young women, young men that remind you maybe of you in your early days. When you look at where photojournalism, war photography is in this day and age, what do you think? Uh, first of all, I think I'd never do it again. Uh, you know, I feel quite right. uh, insecure. As you get older, you get much more insecure. Your body becomes frail. You don't have this, this energy, this will to kind of run across battlefields the way I did. I used to run like an antelope. I knew people were firing at me and trying to kill me, and I thought, you're not going to make it. Not me. They're not going to make killing me. And I used to zigzag across those fields. You know, I felt as if I was, you know, it was impossible to hit me. But, um, you know, a lot of me is kind of, you know, take it with a pinch of salt, really. Um, but now, in my old, older years, my wiser years, I, I look at what these people do today. You know, they're dying like flies, journalists. There's, since I started this, this business, you know, in, in covering wars, hundreds and hundreds of people have lost their lives. And I think to myself, is it worth losing your life for a negative? I don't think it is. What are you photographing today? Uh, well, I think I described just now about how lovely it is where I live. Um, one of the great soothing sides, because of these memories which are constantly tugging at my my arm and saying, you know, do you remember that day? Do you remember that awful day? I go out and stand on the edge of meadows where I live and flooded fields in the Vale of Avalon. It's very close to the Arthurian legend where I live. So I go down and indulge my romantic side and stand on the edge of these flooded fields and naked trees. The truth is, um, you know, I like photographing in the winter which is uh, slightly gloomy mm. in other, but to me, you know, the winter landscape with the naked trees, uh, it's, I suppose in a way, it's, it's almost like taking war photographs. They are way. dark, the dark. photos, yeah. <laughs> I'm a dark person. <laughs> there's darkness in me, but there's quite a lot of joy in me at the same time. You have lived a remarkable life and been to some of the most troubled corners of the world. I wish you well. Thank you very much for coming Thanks, in. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.